for today's class, uh, I'm going to spend time now talking about multi-version concurrency control. Um, and so in last class, we, we talked about OCC, but there was a bunch of stuff that uh, I wanted to cover in the beginning about store procedures. And we sort of rushed through the actual silo protocol, and we ended up skipping the entire TikTok protocol. Uh, and so last year when I taught MVCC, I did it in a single day, like I did OCC in a single day. And we had the same problem where we ended up talking about all this background material, and then we never actually got to the, the core protocols that you guys read about in the paper. So what I'm doing this year, we're going to split up MVCC into two lectures. So today's lecture will be all the background about how you implement MVCC. And then on Monday next week, then we will go into the details of Cicada, Hackathon, and, uh, and um, uh, Hyper, of how they implement MVCC, right? So that's why you know, this is part one of MCC. We're going to cover the background material that you guys, in the paper you guys read, and then we'll do the, the actual hardcore implementations of, of the protocols on, um, on Monday. So for today's class, I'm going to start off talking about compare and swap and how you actually implement it. Uh, and because that's going to sort of be the core primitive we're going to use all throughout sort of in-memory databases, especially in-memory concurrency control. Uh, then we'll talk about isolation levels, and then we'll cover the paper you guys read on MVCC design decisions, and then we'll finish off with the announcement of Project 2, okay? All right, so I think last class I mentioned, or I, I brought up this, you know, who, who here knew what compare and swap was? Uh, not everyone raised their hand, so I want to spend some time going through this and understand what it is, because you're going to need this to understand how we're going to implement in-memory uh, concurrent store protocols. We're also going to need this for project two, because you need to implement a latch-free data structure. So the compare and swap, the basic idea of this is that it's an atomic instruction that the CPU provides that it's going to allow you to examine a location in memory, check to see whether the value is what you expect there to be, and then you can go ahead and, and modify it if it's, if, it that, if it's what you expect there to be. So this is not a new idea. This has been around in, uh, in processors since the 1970s. But now they're pretty much in vogue because everyone's looking to build or use uh, lock-free or latch-free algorithms. And this is the core construct you need in order to implement uh, a latch-free or lock-free algorithm. So the basic idea, again, is, is, is you're going to look at some memory location and check to see whether it matches the value that you give the, the, the instruction. And if the values are equal, then you're allowed to install a new value, overwrite the old one. Right? And then if it's not what you expect there to be, then the instruction will, will fail. Right? So the, the way to use this in your C, C++ code sort of looks like this. Uh, so this looks like a function. Right? It looks like a normal function you would have in STL or, or libc. But this is what is called a CPU intrinsic. Who here has heard of a, what an, knows what an intrinsic is? One in the back, two. OK. Uh, so an intrinsic is basically a way that the compiler allows you to invoke an instruction without having to write the raw assembly to do this. Right? So even though this looks like a function, when the compiler gets this, it knows how to convert this into the single instruction you need to do the, the operation. And so you know it's going to be intrinsic because it has this double uh, underscore as the prefix. All right, so in this example here, we're going to invoke a uh, compare and swap on a memory location and check to see whether it has an integer and uh, install our new one. So the first thing is that the, the first argument to the intrinsic is our address, right? That's some location in memory right? that's going to have a current value. Then we give it our uh, compare value, check to see whether that equals to this. In this case, it does. And if, if so, then we're allowed to install our new value. So in this case here, we would update this memory location uh, and make it 30. And so this, this particular command is called sync, bool, compare, and swap. So what will happen is it will return a true or false to tell you whether the compare and swap was successful. There's other intrinsics that do something similar to do things like it will return the old value uh, of, oh, sorry, it will return the new value that's put into the memory location, and you can use that to compare whether your new value was, was installed. Right? And the core idea about how this all works is that, again, it's a single, literally a single CPU in instruction. If you had to use the dirty mutex to do this, you'd have to acquire the mutex. Then you have an if clause to check to see whether the current value is equal to the value you expect. And then if so, then you go ahead and, and then install your new one. And then, then release the mutex. And as I said last time, mutexes are the Hitler of concurrency. So we want to avoid them. And compare and swap is much better. All right, so in this case here, 
If I try to do the same thing, but I'm, oh, I want my compare value to be 25 to install the new value 35, this instruction would fail because it would see that the value doesn't expect what it doesn't match my compare value, and it would return false. And therefore, you knew that this thing didn't actually uh, install the correct value. So we could use this in the uh, in the do the tr timestamp uh, increments or the uh, transaction ID increments from the OCC last class, right? We could do uh, a compare and swap to do at plus one plus one plus, plus one, uh, and we're going to use this for other things later on that we'll talk about today. How to install new transaction IDs in our timestamps for uh, new and new timestamps, new transaction IDs inside of our tuples to let us know when a particular version is visible. So, so is this clear? Right in also C plus plus that you can, you can get a um, you can have std atomic and you, you can wrap a integer or a boolean or some other uh, primitive type around the atomic flag and that was going to provide you the same uh, the same functionality. So in general, you maybe you want to use if you're writing C++, you don't always want to write intrinsics. You want to write using the, the what, what C++ provides you. Okay. So now the next thing I want to cover is, is spend a little time talking about uh, isolation levels. So in last class, and certainly in most introduction database classes, we spend a lot of time going on about how great serializability is. Right? We say that this is the gold standard of what you would want in a transaction processing database system because it allows your programmers to not have to think about the correctness of their program, meaning they can write transaction code in their application and assume that the transactions are going to be executed in serial order, even though we know the, the, the database system, for the most part, most systems will interleave their operations. Right? But then the end state of the database is equivalent to one where they are executed in serial order. So that means that we don't have to write any special code in our application to reason about uh, inconsistent data, right? We don't have to worry about our transaction reading data from a transaction that hasn't committed yet um, or getting back in different values. So the problem, though, with serializability is that in, it's useful for us to reason about, but in practice, it's often that people don't use this because trying to achieve serializability often requires additional checks and mechanisms and limits the amount of parallelism and concurrency you can have in your system, right? And so a lot of systems end up foregoing serialized be altogether, and they want to run at what is called a lower isolation level. And these lower isolation levels, as they're defined in the SQL standard, are specified in terms of what different anomalies that, can, that transaction may occur while it runs. So what we'll see is that in today's class, we'll mostly talk about uh, snapshot isolation. But then on uh, Monday's class, when we actually go to the actual protocols, we'll see how they try to achieve uh, serializability in their protocols. But the reality is in the real world, not everyone needs this. But it's good for us to understand what's going on. So the way you can control the amount of parallelism you can have in your database system is to specify what isolation level you want your transactions to run at. right? And so the isolation levels are defined in terms of, again, what anomalies or what issues your transactions could be exposed to while they're running. And the standard defines them in terms of these three types of anomalies. So anybody that's taken an introductory database class should be able to give me definitions for these. So what's a dirty read? You know, he said you read data from an uncommitted transaction. Correct. What's an unrepeatable read other than him? So she said, you read a value once, then somebody changes it, and then you read that value again, and you get a different value. Correct, yes. Right, this can occur even though the other transaction that modified the data, even if they committed, uh, then you would see their committed data. And it, it's not what it looked like when you first started. This one's a little bit more tricky. What's a phantom read? You select a point that is increased, but between like, phones, you insert a new component. So you cannot, like... Right, so he said that uh, a phantom can occur, and actually I'm going to expand, you, you got it half right, okay? A phantom can occur if you, if you uh, read a, a, a range of data, a, re, a range of tuples, and you, read, you do the scan the first time, then you go do it a second time, and in between the first time and the second time, someone else has come and either added new data or deleted data, so that when you compute the scan, now you see things that weren't there before. So this can come up in, in like an aggregation query. If I want to count the number of tuples of all the students with the age, you know, 18 to 25, like this class, uh, 
If I scan it the first time, I see 10 tuples. Then somebody inserts a new record with uh, someone age 22. I scan it again. Now I get 11 records. Right? That's considered a phantom. It was something that wasn't there uh, b b before when I ran before, when I ran my query the first time. Right? And it's not the same thing as a dirty read or unpeatable read because I didn't I couldn't read the thing before because it didn't exist in case it was an insert. So if I come back, it's not like I read it before and I got a different value. It's just it didn't exist before. Right? So the SQL standard defines these isolation levels in terms of those anomalies and it specifies in them, again, what anomalies could occur. And I say could or potentially could occur because there's no guarantee that your transaction is going to hit these anomalies if you run it at a lower isolation level. Because it depends, obviously, on what other transactions are running at the same time and what those other transactions are doing. So if your application only has a single thread and it's executing one transaction one after another in, in, in serial order, then even if you run at the lowest isolation level, you're not going to have any dirty reads or other problems because no other transaction could be running at the same time. This really only matters when, you get, when again, you're in a highly concurrent environment where you have a bunch of simultaneous transactions running at the same time, and we could be reading data that we shouldn't be. So at the very top, the strongest is serializable. Right? This means you have no phantoms, all your, re repeats are re or all your reads are repeatable, and then you have no dirty reads. And then as you go down to these lower isolation levels, you get... You, you could incur more anomalies. So when you go to repeat or reads, then you end up, you could have phantoms. When you go to recommitted, you could have phantoms or unrepeat or reads, and then read uncommitted, or all bets are off, and any one of those anomalies could occur. Yes, question? No, right. Another way to think about this is in terms of this hierarchy, right? So at the very top, you have the most protection, and at the bottom, you have the, the least amount of protection, right? And these sort of subsume each other. So, Again, in a academic environment, we say serializable is great. Of course, you want to run your transactions uh, with that protection, with that isolation level. But the reality is most people don't. And part of the reason is that when you go look at what real systems actually support, uh, it's not serializable. It doesn't come up a lot. So this is a table that Peter Bayless, a professor at Stanford, generated a few years ago, where he looked at the manuals for a bunch of di different database systems that people are actually using for real applications. And he looked at what the default isolation level was, and he looked at what the maximum isolation level the system uh, purported to be able to support. And so what you see here is that in the default column, only two systems support serializable by default, VoltDB and Ingress. Right? And so VoltDB is based on HDOR, the system I helped build, and that's because they have these single threaded execution engines that only allow one transaction run at a time, so you can never have uh, an anomaly. So you, you, you essentially get uh, serializable by default. And then what we see for the maximum isolation level, some of these systems, like for example, MemSQL, don't even support you know, serializable at all. Right? They, they're, they're okay with running it recommitted. So again, the main takeaway here is that most systems by default run at a lower isolation level, usually recommitted, and most applications don't change this. Uh, so I don't have the graphs here, but we've done surveys with, with DBAs, and we find that most people run whatever their system is, most people run with the default. And that's probably good enough for them, right? Uh, you know, Facebook runs at repeatable reads, uh, and they have the largest MySQL installation in the world, and for them, that's fine, right? <coughs> so the other thing I want to point out here is that there's actually two different isolation levels that weren't in my chart of four that I had before. So for DB2, their default isolation level is something called cursor stability. And then for Oracle, their maximum isolation level is something called snapshot isolation. So in Oracle, actually, you can say, I want, my, I want serializable transactions. And it'll say, and the data system will come back and say, yeah, go ahead, you got it, right? But in reality, you don't get that, you get something lower, you get snapshot isolation, right? So what are these other isolation levels? Uh, and why, why weren't they included in the standard? Well, it turns out that the, when the standard came out in 1992, um, the, 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 the standards body that wrote it, they were taking this view of concurrency control from a perspective of the, that the database system is implementing two-phase locking, right? And therefore, the, all of the anomalies that they talk about are in the context of a two-phase locking database system. But as I said last class, there's another whole other class of concurrency protocols, the, the timestamp ordering ones, that are, are, are di completely different than how two-phase locking works. And it turns out that they don't hit the same anomalies 
at least not in exactly the same ones that I, that I showed before, when you run an, in another scheme. And in particular, we we'll see this when we talk about multi-version concurrency control. Uh, they, by default, have snapshot isolation guarantees. So we need to understand what these actually are. So I'll, I'll go through both of these. And so the, the first one was cursor stability. And as I said, this was the default in, uh, in DB2. And so the, the way to sort of understand cursor stability uh, is you got to kind of throw out everything you know about two-phase locking, all right, for just, just to go with this, right? And the way, the way to understand what a cursor is is essentially a pointer inside the database system of, uh, of what, that points at whatever data item, say a tuple, that the query is operating on at that moment. So let's say that I need to access, uh, and, and, and the cursor will require locks with the things that it wants to access. So say I want to scan uh, two tuples, my cursor would find the first tuple, acquire the lock on that, do whatever it is it needs to do, then release that lock, and then go grab the cursor lock on the second tuple, and then do whatever it is it needs to do on that. And then when it's done, it releases that lock. So that looks a lot different than what we talked about before in, with two-phase locking, right? With two-phase locking, we, we said that uh, in the growing phase, you acquire all the locks you need, but then as soon as you release one lock, then you're now you're in the shrinking phase, and you can never go back and acquire another lock. But with cursor stability locking or cursor locking, you can do that. And they don't have to worry about deadlocks because they, they say that only one query can hold one cursor lock at a time. So I can't acquire a lock and then go acquire another one. I acquire my lock, do whatever I need to do, then I give it up before I'm allowed to go and get the next one. And because of that, you don't have, you don't have deadlocks. Now, with multi-threading, that makes it a little bit more difficult, but the, the general idea is the same. So, cursor stability turns out to be another isolation level that exists before, in between read, repeatable reads and read committed. So, it's stronger than read committed, but weaker than repeatable reads. And the reason why it's stronger than recommitted because it's going to prevent something that's called the lost update anomaly. Which again, when I talked about those anomalies at the beginning, dirty reads, unrepeatable reads, phantom reads, this thing wasn't in there. So we, we need to understand what that is. Yes? Uh, can cursor stability have uh, dirty reads because you take a lock, like what you said, you take a lock, let's say a transaction one takes a lock on a tuple, changes it, uh, releases the lock and takes the lock on tuple two. And transaction two comes in and takes a lock on tuple one, which is, it's basically has a dirty value because transaction one hasn't committed yet. So his question is, can you have dirty reads in, uh, with cursor locking? Um, there's some extra stuff you have to do to make sure that you don't read things from transactions that haven't committed yet, right? Uh, but you're not guaranteed to have repeatable reads because you, can st you would come back and read something that, that is committed. Question or no? Okay. So let's look at a really simple example. So we have two transactions, T1, T2. T1 wants to do a read on A, write on A. Transaction T2 wants to do a write on A. And for this, we're going to assume that we're running on a system that only has one core. That means only one thread could, has the program counter could actually be, be making forward progress while executes transactions. So we would start here. Transaction T1 wants to do a read on A. So it goes and acquires the cursor lock for A, reads it, and then releases the lock. Then transaction two uh, starts running, right? We have, we have a context switch. Transaction two starts running, uh, grabs the cursor lock on A, does the write, and then releases that lock. Then we have a cursor, uh, the context switch back over here. He, uh, this guy gets the cursor lock on A, modifies it, and then releases that lock, and then it goes ahead and commits, right? And then at some later point, transaction T2 is going to commit. But now the problem is that we, we, you know, we, we end up losing this update because although in our physical time, transaction T2 committed after T1, all the transactions are only going to see the update from this guy because this guy overwrote this one because we only had cursor locks. Right? So a cursor lock in general will prevent this problem, but not always. There are other scenarios where uh, it won't do this correctly. Right? So if this guy... Uh, if he held his cursor lock until he committed, since he knows he wasn't going to do anything afterwards, then this write would have to block, and this guy would get committed first. Or if this guy held the cursor lock on the read and held it to A, then this guy would block because it couldn't acquire the cursor lock, and then it could do the write afterwards, and we wouldn't have that, that anomaly. So this is a bit esoteric. Uh, 
this only occurs in systems that, again, that use cursor locks like DB2. Uh, in the MVC systems that we, we talk about today and next class, uh, they don't have cursor locks, so they don't have this problem. But it's good to understand this because, it, again, it may show up. It shows up in literature when, they, when people talk about the different isolation levels and what, the, uh, what else is actually out there beyond the, what the standard specifies. Question. Yes? So if I hold the lock until you need to, hold, uh, to acquire another lock. So. Correct, yes. It's quite, so his statement is, with a cursor lock, do you hold the lock until you need to acquire the other lock? Yes. OK. All right, the one I do want to spend more time on is snaps isolation. So the, the way to think about snaps isolation is that the database system is going to be able to guarantee that when a transaction starts, it will see a consistent snapshot of the database as it existed at the moment that transaction started. And the key word I'm saying in that sentence is, is, is consistent. And so what that means is that the snapshot will not contain any modifications from other transactions that have not committed yet. So say I have transaction T1, it starts, it updates uh, the database, and then transaction T2 starts. It will not see the updates from transaction T1 because that transaction did not commit, and therefore its view of the database with its modifications is not consistent, uh, a, a consistent snapshot. So the transaction T2 will see the view of the database as it existed before T1 started, right? So when a transaction wants to commit under snapshot isolation, uh, if we have to check to see whether our write set conflicts with any other transaction, any other update since we started and created our snapshot. And if there's no conflicts, then, then we're allowed to go ahead and, and commit. Right? So this sounds awesome, right? This sounds like it, this be basically serializable, right? Well, it turns out that uh, this snapshot is, the snapshot isolation is susceptible to another anomaly, again, that wasn't in the original three that I defined before, called the right skew anomaly. And this is actually something that, that cannot occur with uh, repeatable reads. This is something that is specific to uh, snapshot isolation. So the way to understand snap isolation, or this right skew anomaly, is I always like to use as an example that was invented by Jim Gray a few years ago, um, I guess two decades ago. And the way to sort of think about this, is rather than worry about tuples and, other, and indexes and other things like that, let's just say we have a database that has marbles. And we have uh, marbles can be either black or they can be white. So when we start off in our, in our database, we have two black marbles and two white marbles. And we're going to execute two transactions at exactly the same time on two separate threads. And they're both going to make changes to the database. So the first transaction is going to want to change all the white marbles to black. And then the second transaction is going to want to change all the black marbles to white. So when they start running at exactly the same time, this represents their consistent snapshot of the database. So they see it exactly as it existed when they started. So now when they start running, the, the, they're going to try to. They're going to find all the white marbles, at least in the top. I'm going to switch them to black. The bottom guy is going to find all the black marbles, and he's going to switch them to white. So now they're, they're both. Their, their snapshot of the database has all black marbles at the top and all white marbles to, to at the bottom. But now the issue is when they go to commit, we're going to end up with this state. And the reason is because the right set for this this transaction here does not overlap with the right set of the bottom one. So he was allowed to install his two white marbles, and the bottom guy allowed, allowed to install his, his black marbles. Right? Is this, is this equivalent to a serializable schedule? Right? No. Because right? what would a serializable schedule be? Well, it would be that we would first execute the, the transaction one, it would flip all the, the white marbles to black, then transaction two would flip all the black marbles to white, and we would end up with either all white marbles or all black marbles. So the point here is that this is an anomaly that should not occur if we have a truly uh, conflict serializable schedule, but under snapshot isolation, you don't. You have something that's slightly less than that. Right? And this requires us to do extra stuff to avoid this problem of having these, 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 these separate updates. So the way to actually think about now your isolation levels is not the sort of straight hierarchy that I showed before. It's actually something more complicated, right? So now we have cursor stability in here, and it's in between recommitted and repeatable reads. 
And then snapshot isolation is something over here on the side, that's completely separate. Right? It's another path up going up. Right? It's actually even way more complicated than this. Uh, so one of the optional readings uh, that, that's on the, 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 for the class for today's lecture is this great paper uh, from this guy, Atu Aditya. Uh, he basically wrote the, 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 an, an amazing thesis in the late 90s about different isolation levels you can have in, in data management systems. And the, 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 this is actually not even the full thing, but this is roughly what the view looks like, right? So what we see in here, we have our cursor stability, we have snapshot isolation, right? These are all, uh, you know, it's, it's way more complicated, there's way more things, and not all database systems will provide all these, right? Typically, they only have you know, either the main four or less than that, right? And then we see actually also as well, full serializability is what we're referring to as serializable in, in database systems, but there's something even, even above that called strict serializability, and this is equivalent to what is called external consistency. So this means that if I, well, full serializability means that if I transmit transaction T1 first, followed by a little bit later by transaction T2, then T1 will commit first, followed by T2. Under serializability, general serializability, you're allowed to, to flip those orders. So I only bring this up to show, just to say that like, this is way more complicated than I'm showing here. Uh, and this is why transactions and curve control is really hard in, in, in database systems. Because it's all these corner cases, all these other issues you gotta deal with beyond just, oh, do, you know, am I, am I reading data from an uncommitted transaction? All right, so any questions about snapshot isolation? Or the right skew anomaly? So as, as I said, in this lecture, uh, we're not gonna go into too much detail how to handle the right skew anomaly in MVCC. We'll see that on Monday in this class, okay? And the paper you guys read, which you know I wrote, uh, we cheat in some ways, cheat in quotes, because we avoid uh, the right skew anomaly because we don't have any range queries, right? Everything's always point queries, and those are easy to make make serialized with. Okay. So with that, now we can talk about MVCC. So MVC, the MVCC uh, protocol, the basic idea is that the database management system is going to maintain multiple physical versions of an object in the database uh, to represent a single logical object. And for simplicity, we, we can assume an object is a tuple, right? So what's gonna happen is that when a transaction <coughs> updates an object, when it writes to an object, the database management system is gonna make a new version of that object that's moving forward in time that represents that change that transaction made. And we're still gonna maintain the history up to, to a certain point of all the previous versions that, that came before it. And this is why we get snapshot isolation for free because if we have those older versions, then if our transaction comes along and we, it gets a timestamp, then it knows how to use, look at those older versions to figure out what, the, what should I be allowed to see? How do I get my consistent snapshot? Right, and that, so that's what we do with the read. So when we do a read on an object, we need to know what version should we be allowed to see and that's gonna be based on what was existed at the moment that the, what, was, what existed in the database system from a committed transaction at the moment that transaction started. So MVCC as itself is, is not a new protocol. Uh, it was first proposed in a dissertation by somebody at MIT in 1978. It was then the later implemented in the early 80s uh, at DEC uh, in a system called Interbase. Um, Interbase has still exists. I think some, because DEC doesn't exist anymore, but the Interbase as a system still exists. Uh, some company has it and they're rebranding it as a, a mobile database. But as far as I can tell, it's still the, you know, derived from the original uh, Interbase from the 1980s. The Interbase from the 1990s, when Borland bought it, uh, has, was open sourced as Firebird in the, I think about, about a decade or so ago, actually maybe longer. All right, so this is available today, you, you can go get that. And you, and you can go buy this from the company. Um, the fun fact is the original name of Firefox was actually gonna be Firebird, uh, but then because it overlapped with these guys, they, they ended up having to rename it to Firefox, All right? So although this protocol is from the 1970s, uh, what is very fascinating about it is that basically with a few exceptions, Every single major data management system that has been come out in the last 10, 10 years, that can, any system that does transactions, uses MVCC, right? So part of what this, you know, this, this lecture is about and what the reading was about was 
us to try to figure out why. You know, what is it about MVCC that you know makes it be something that people want to use versus like uh, in place updates or two you know or sort of yeah a, a single version system. So the, the three main things that people tout for the benefit you get from MVCC are the following. The first is that your writers, your writing transactions or writing threads will not block any reading threads, right? Because the reading threads can always read an older version and the writing thread can always create, create new versions. The other benefit we're going to get is that if we have any read-only transactions, they can read a consistent snapshot of the database without requiring any locks without requiring us to track their, their read set. So in SQL, you, when you start a new transaction, you say begin, you can specify that it's going to be a read-only transaction. And the data system can use that hint to uh, optimize how it actually tracks the, the behavior of your transaction. So in our system in Peloton, if you tell us you're a read-only transaction, we disable the read set tracking. Because right? there's no reason to do that because we're reading a consistent snapshot of the database. So we're seeing things that, that existed at the moment our transaction started. It may not be the newest version, of the database, but who cares, right? With serializable ordering, that's that's fine. And the last feature uh, that comes up often, but I'm not actually, I don't, I don't see it being used that often though, uh, is support for time travel queries. So a time travel query basically allows you to say, execute this query on my database, execute the select statement as the as the database existed, or on the state of the database that as it existed one hour ago or one day ago, or one week ago, depending on how much, how much history you have. And we can do this because we have, we're going to assign timestamps to all our transactions, so we'll know what was the timestamp, what was the version ID that existed one hour ago when, when they want to execute this query, and we know that we can skip any newer versions that come after that timestamp, and only read the, 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 you know, that, that snapshot of the database uh, in the past. So this is not a new idea. Uh, this is actually was used in the, this was one of the, the original features of the first, first version of Postgres. They talked about how they could support time travel queries. Uh, later on in the 1990s, I think like late 90s, like 99, 1999, when people started using the open source version of Postgres, uh, they end up turning this off because you, you run out of space pretty quickly if you're doing a lot of updates, right? If they maintain all these, these, these version histories. But a lot of new systems that come out now talk about how they can do time travel queries. And as, as we'll see as we go along, it essentially means you just turn off garbage collection, right? And maybe add a little extra syntax in the SQL statement to allow you to go back in time, right? Uh, Microsoft is happy to sell you a package that supports time travel queries. And that does require some additional code to do something different than what Microsoft normally does. Uh, but again, when you're doing MVCC, you, you essentially get this for free if you just don't clean up anything. But the reason why I say I don't know how useful this is because the only place I've ever seen this being used is in like financial companies where they have to do this for like regulatory reasons. So, it's, so if, under Sarbanes Oxley, Oxley, because of the US government, you have to maintain your, a seven year, year history of, of your database. So you need to go back in time and say, you know, what transaction occurred you know, six or seven years ago? And time travel queries is one way to do this. But for most applications, when you think about it, you're already starting to kind of doing this anyway uh, in, in, in your application. So like when you order stuff on Amazon, uh, Amazon doesn't doesn't use the multi-version uh, multi-versioning to to maintain different order histories, right? It creates a new uh, tuple to insert for your new order, and it inserts all the new order items. So you can easily go back in time and see what orders I bought uh, a year ago because they're just separate tuples, right? So the usefulness is, is I think of this is actually quite limited. But I haven't seen a really compelling reason beyond just what you know the financial guys need, and they often just take snapshots anyway and, and keep keep those as, as a as separate files. So the important thing that I want you to get out of the paper that I signed to you guys, and this is a mistake that I made, uh, you know, when I was younger, is that although it's called multi-version concurrency control, it's more than just concurrency control, right? So this is the confusing part from last class of like there's the, there's the optimistic concurrency control protocol. But then there's also a class of protocols called optimistic concurrency control, right? So there is a original multi-version concurrency protocol from the 1978 thesis, uh, but then now it encompasses so many other things because it permeates how you're going to design all different parts of the system, right? All the different design decisions. And that's essentially the paper that I had you guys read was we try to go figure out how do you actually want to implement a, an MVCC database system, a modern MVCC database system. And so the, the way this sort of started was 
when we first started building Peloton, there's all these questions came up about how like, how should we how should we store different versions? How should we maintain our indexes? How should we do garbage collection? And when you go read a lot of the academic papers that talk about in-memory MVCC, they usually talk about the first part. They talk about how they how you know, and they they evaluate this first part in much more detail than the other parts. So for like garbage collection, they'll say, oh, this is the way we do it. They may say a little bit why they did it, but they never actually compared all the other different possibilities. So this paper is basically, we're going to implement everything we know about, everything, all the things we know you need for an MVC system. We're going to implement it in, in, in one database system, and just run a complete parameter sweep, a benchmark on every possible combination. And then whatever one turns out to be the best, that's what we'll just end up using in Peloton. Right? So that, that was the motivation for this paper. So as I said last class, the original title of this paper was not an empirical evaluation of multi-version concurrency control. The original title was, this is the best paper ever on in-memory multi-version concurrency control. And I still stand by that today, right? Uh, so the reviewers came back, this was VODB, they came back and said, well, this is a bit, that's a subjective statement, can you be a bit more scientific, right? So then our next title was, if you only read one empirical evaluation paper on in-memory multi-version in multi concurrency control, make it this one, exclamation point. So then they came back and said, no, uh, you can't do that either. Can you make it uh, you know, a, a little bit less direct? So then I said, uh, we think you'll really enjoy this empirical evaluation paper <laughs> on memory vault version control. So now at this point, the paper was accepted. But then the, the program chair basically came down and says, I, we, you got to change this title or, or rejecting this paper. So I don't have tenure. All right? I, you know, I, I needed this paper. The student that was working on it needed this paper. So we, I. I broke down, and <laughs> we ended up with that title. It is what it is. That's fine. OK, so the other thing, so these are the four things that covered in this paper. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about something that goes beyond this paper uh, that wasn't in this, in, in this, and I'll talk about how we handle transaction ID wraparound, which I think is actually an interesting problem. And I know how Postgres does it. Uh, for the other ones, it's not clear how they do it, but this is something we can investigate later. All right, so I'll go through each of these. So, this is the table we generated from the paper that, again, just shows you all the different data systems that are out there that are doing MVCC and how they implement all those four different design decisions. So the first three at the top, Oracle, Postgres, and, and MySQL, these are obviously not uh, in-memory database systems, but we thought to include them just for historical reasons. The actual the first version of Oracle from the 1970s didn't actually do MVCC, didn't do transactions at all. They only added that later into like 1983, 1984. Um, and so the rest down here from high rise Hecaton, MemSQL, HANA, NuoDB, and Hyper, these are all in-memory systems. And the main thing to show here is that no one system implements MVCC exactly the same. Right? So we, so we need to figure out what, what is it about uh, these different implementations that makes one better than, than another. And try to, pick, you know, try to identify that, and that's what we want to implement in our system. So before we get to that, we're going to talk a little bit about what we need actually need to store now in our tuples to do uh, multi-version concurrency control. So in every single tuple, we're going to have a header uh, that we're going to use to keep track of the metadata about this particular version of, of the tuple. So you're always going to have a transaction ID, and that's going to correspond to uh, the transaction that is either holding the lock or latch for this tuple, or the transaction that made this version. Uh, then we're going to have a begin and end timestamp, and that's going to correspond to the visibility of this version. Right? So any transaction that has a timestamp uh, that is in between this range should be allowed to see this version. And then we're going to have a pointer that's either going to point to the next or the previous version of the tuple in our, our version chain. And I'll explain what that is later. Um, and then there'll be some additional field for, you know, for whatever extra metadata you have. Right? I think for... Uh, for two-phase locking, we could put the read lock or the write lock inside there. Others, other, other, the other protocols do other things. So, the co the key thing I want to point out here, though, is we have if we, if we ignore the additional metadata, we have four fields that we have to have per tuple, and for an in memory system, these are all going to be 64-bit pointers or, or, or sorry, 64-bit uh, uh, integers, right? So we have four eight-byte fields we have to store per tuple. This doesn't seem like a lot, but when you actually look at much larger database sizes, this becomes uh, actually quite significant. So there are 30, so I have four, I have 30, 32, uh, 32 bytes at the store per tuple. So if I have a billion tuples, then I have to have 32 gigabytes of storage just for the multi-versioning metadata. 
right? And if you're an in-memory database, that means I have to dedicate 32 gigabytes of memory just to store the metadata, right? So that's a lot. Um, and this is just meant to show you how, uh, although multi-versioning seems awesome and it, and it provides a lot of benefits, it doesn't come for free, right? And so this occur multiple times throughout the semester where there's this classic trade-off in databases of like you know, compute versus storage, or compute versus memory. Um, this is one good example. We'll see next class in Hecaton, you actually can get, can get rid of one of these fields, but it's still, it's still not, uh, you know, it's, it's not a non-trivial amount. All right, so the first thing we gotta deal with is the current show protocol. And there's essentially three approaches, right? You can use timestamp ordering, OCC, and then the two-phase locking. Then there's the fourth approach of the serializable snapshot isolation, or SSI. I'll cover that paper in more detail on, on Monday. Uh, and so I'm going to skip the discussion of these two here because this is what we discussed last class, right? It's kind of easy to see how you can take OCC and just make it multi-version, right? You do all your writes to your private workspace, and then when you uh, want to go commit, you do you do the validation as you, as you would normally would, and then the workspace just essentially just becomes the new versions, right? Two-phase locking, you just acquire the lock on any physical version before you're allowed to read and write to it. But I want to spend more time talking about timestamp ordering because this is actually how it was defined in the original MVCC paper from 1978. But I'm going to show how to do this in the context of an in-memory database. All right, so say we have a sample database here, and then we have uh, two versions. So the first thing to point out is that we're going to store the transaction ID. And for this, we're going to use the transaction ID as a way to represent the transaction that holds the lock or latch for, the, for this tuple, for, the, sorry, for this physical version. And then we're going to have the begin and end timestamp. And so for the end timestamp, if it's the newest version, we'll just set it to infinity, meaning anybody with the timestamp greater than the begin timestamp should be able to see it. The new thing we're going to add, though, sorry, is this read timestamp. And this is going to be just like we in the basic timestamp ordering protocol that we had before, where we're going to use this read timestamp to keep track of the, last, the, the timestamp of the last transaction that read to this. And this always has to be in, increasing in time. It can never go back in time. So let's say we have one transaction here, and it wants to do a read on A followed by a uh, write on B. And we'll assume that when the transaction starts, that we'll give it some transaction ID, right? It doesn't matter what method we use, it just has to be unique and has to always be increasing. So in this case here, the transaction ID is 10. So now a transaction can do a read on an object if it is allowed to, if its timestamp is within the range between the begin and the end timestamp, and the transaction ID is set to zero, meaning there's no transaction that holds the latch for this physical version in memory. So in this case, it's allowed to do that. So we need to go update its read timestamp to now increment that forward. And we do this with compare and swap, right? We read the first value, we get a one. Then we invoke the compare and swap and say, replace one with 10 if it's still one when I check. In this case, it is, right? So if we come back and we see that someone else changed it, if that new value is less than our timestamp, then we would try it again. If that timestamp is greater than our timestamp, then we stop, and then we don't try to do it, right? Because the, the, the read timestamp always has to be increasing. So now I want to do the write on B. And so for this, I'm going to create a new version. Uh, if no other transaction holds the lock for this version, um, and my timestamp is greater than the last transaction that read this. And again, we, wanted, we, we said last class we had to do this because we don't want someone in the future to have read this tuple and, and the, read the logical tuple and not see our, our new value or our, our new physical version. So in this case here, we'll do the compare and swap on this. We, we can set it to 10. That means now we hold the latch for it. And then we'll go ahead and now cr make a copy of, of the old version and create a new version here. We set the transaction ID to us by default, which means we implicitly hold the lock. And then now we can do whatever it is that, uh, we want to update the value. So the next step is to go back now and set the end timestamp for the old version to our transaction ID. And this tells anybody that comes along that says, all right, if your timestamp is greater than 10, then you don't want to look at this version. Follow the pointer, which I'm not showing here, but follow the pointer to get up to the next version. And that's the one you actually, you, you might want to read. So for this, this is actually not uh, completely serializable uh, because if I release the locks, then someone may come along and read this newer version, but I haven't committed yet. So we'll see this on Hecaton and other protocols next week. There's extra stuff you have to do to make sure that uh, people don't, other transactions know that whether you've committed or not and they don't read things from uncommitted transactions. 
So I'm just showing you how you can set, do compare and swap to flip these uh, different fields embedded in the header to allow you to tell other transactions what's going on uh, without having to have a central data structure. Right, that's another key thing we get from in memory system as well. When I set the, these locks, I could do this directly inside the tuple header. I didn't have to have a separate lock table, right? Because I know this thing's never gonna be swapped out the disk. Is this clear? Okay. So the other more important things we can talk about though is the version storage. So as I said, the, the database system on MVCC is going to create multiple physical versions for a single logical object. And the question is now, how do we actually want to store those different versions? All right, there's a bunch of different ways. And so the way to think about how the data is going to organize these different versions is through what is called a version chain. So we need an efficient way to allow us to say, to, you know, here's the logical tuple, you know, here's the first physical version, and be able to check some way to find the actual physical version that is actually visible to you. And we're going to do this through what is called the, the, the version chain. You can think of this as a single direction linked list that is going to go from one version to the, to the next. You only want to go one direction because you can't compare and swap two addresses at the same time, right? So you always want to go one direction. And so what will happen is we'll do some lookup on an index or scan on the database, and we're going to find a, uh, you know, we'll, we'll find the head of the version chain. And depending on how we order it, we, the first version may be the oldest version, the first version might be the newest version. And we may need to traverse that chain to find the one that we're looking for. So as we'll see, the index are always going to point at the head of the chain, uh, and, we, and, and the thread knows how to jump through from one version to the next. So now one thing I won't talk, won't talk about too much is that, but in an in-memory system, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to store all these versions in thread local storage uh, for each thread. So each thread is going to have its own, I think the paper calls them a memory space or a memory pool. So as I create a new version, my, my, my thread creates a new version, I don't store this in a global heap, I store this in memory that's local to me, meaning it's going to be physically close to my, my core. So if I have a multi-socket machine, it's not the, another socket's memory, it's my, it's my local memory. And so I do this because I want to avoid contention on any centralized data structure. So I'm the only thread that could be writing to my, my, my local storage, so I, need, I don't need to acquire a latch to get a new free slot. Right? I can just go grab the next one I know but nobody else is trying to steal from me. Now, this, this means though that now the versions themselves, for a single logical tuple, the version chain may span multiple uh, memory pools for different threads, which is fine because a thread can jump through memory. It's just when we do updates, uh, they always have to be local to you. And so the... Different storage teams are going to go through now are going to determine where physically in memory and what we're, uh, we're going to store these new versions and what, what we actually want to store. So we'll go through each of them. There's the three approaches. There's the pendulum only storage, time travel storage, and delta storage. All right, so again, I'll, I'll go through examples of all of these. So with the pendulum only storage, the basic idea is that every single time I create a new version, uh, I just insert a new tuple in my regular table heap. Right, so there's only a single storage space for my table, right? We can ignore how things are actually spread across multiple, uh, multiple threads. But the way to think about it is that there's just one heap, that's a, there's a ch chunk of memory that everyone's going to put new versions into. And so now what I'm showing here is that now we have our pointer is just pointing to, uh, for a tuple, it's pointing to the, the next version. So in this case here, the, the head of the version chain would point to A1. So this would be the oldest version. And then we can follow the pointer and get to A2. And then B1 doesn't have another version, so it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have a pointer to anything else. So all the physical versions of a single logical tuple are now stored in, in, in the same table space. And any single time I update a tuple, then I'm going to uh, copy the contents of the tuple I'm updating into a new slot in my table space right, with the updated value. And then I go back and update the pointer now to point to my new version, right? So at this point here, no one can see my new version because I haven't updated that pointer. So I do a compare and swap and say, all right, now I'm going to change this pointer now to point it to mine. If that fails, then I know somebody else tried to create a new version, and, I just, and then I just follow that pointer and then do a compare and swap on its pointer to point to me, right? So the this is the easiest way to actually implement this in some ways because the tuples are always the same size, 
So it's it's really easy just to make a copy into it and, and copy the, the contents of the old tuple and put it into the, to the new one, right? And this example here, I'm showing oldest to newest, right? The, the version chain points to, always points to the head of the, is always the oldest, and then you have to traverse it to find the newest. The other approach is to do newest to oldest, where the, the version chain is always going to be the newest tuple, and if you need to go back in time and find an older version, you have, then you follow the version chain that way. So the there's trade-offs, obviously, for each of these, and it depends on what your application or what your workload is actually trying to do. So if you have a lot of uh, insert queries, then uh, or, or, or queries that want to always find the latest version, then newest to oldest is probably what you want because you always you know you follow the index, you land to the version chain, and voila, that's the single, that's the exact tuple that you wanted. If you're doing a lot of maybe read-only queries uh, that want to look back at older versions, then it might make sense to do this. But then also depends on how many indexes you have, as, as we'll see in a second, because if you have a lot of indexes, then every single time you create a new version, uh, you have, you have and with newest to oldest, you have to go update the pointer to that version chain. Whereas in this one, you don't, right? So again, they all have these different trade-offs. No one way is better than another. Yes? Uh, when you create a new version, why can't you just, uh... Let's say there's a the new version is a new node. Why can't you just copy the data of the old node to the new node and make the changes in the old node and just move the pointers around so that the memory address of the latest version does not change? In which case, you don't have to move change the indexes. So his his question is: instead of making a copy of the tuple and then making the change to my new copy, my new version, what if I copied the old version down here, but then made my change there, right. and then now I don't have to update any tuples. I just change the pointers around, uh, I just change the pointers so that... Uh, that this thing's now the newest, and so this should point to here, and then this should point to there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the same, that is one way to do it, and that's essentially what time travel storage basically is, right? Uh, in time travel storage, what happens is, instead of having a single table space, you have the uh, you have a separate space where you put older versions, and it essentially gives you the same thing, right? But what you're proposing actually again it depends on what the application is, right? That actually might be bad if, if you know I have to think about it depending on your workload, right? Because in that case you don't have to go and change the pointers in the indexes, right? You still have the newest to oldest, but you don't have the problem of going changing the uh, pointers at all the indexes and all the indexes. I, I had to think of, again, I, I, we can take it offline, I had to think about it. I think you might have some correctness issues because now you need to update two pointers atomically. And that and that's hard, right? With uh, with the version chain always going in one direction, you just do a compare and swap of one address and then that automatically fixes your problem. Yes? Is it common that these are like knobs in the database or is that too much engineering? So his question is, is it common that just, not just like whether to do oldest or newest, but are all of these things. Yeah, like all the versions. Yeah, all like his question is: Is it is it common that data systems allow you to tune knobs and change what what scheme you're using for all these different design decisions? Nobody does that because it's way too much engineering, right? You use, again, most systems pick one, and that's what they just use. In the back. His question is, was, was, was this not a huge effort to implement this in Peloton and have all of them? Yes. <laughs> I mean, whatever to say, right? Uh, but we had, uh, it was three students that took this class, and plus a visiting PG student banged it out over hmm, four or five months. Right? It was, I mean, it was a lot of work, yeah. Um, okay, so the, the next version scheme is uh, time travel tables. And so for this, instead of having all our new versions be stored in the, the same table heap, we're going to have a separate table location or separate storage area where we're going to put either the oldest versions or the newest versions. So in this case here, uh, the version chain would always point to the main table. You can think of these as like the master versions of the tuple. And then the time travel tables where we stole the, stored the older versions. So on every update, what we'll end up doing is again copy the latest version into our uh, time travel table. And then we can update the pointer to now point to this thing. And then now we can do a compare and swap to, uh, or we, we overwrite the master version in the main table with the new value, and then we do a compare and swap to now point to, to the new version. All right, so this, this makes sure we have a correct version chain. So this is what HANA does. 
Um, HANA actually goes oldest and newest, so the master version here is always the oldest version. Uh, I don't know why they argue that they want to do this. I have to go check their papers again, but I think the gist of it was that they want to support, they want to be optimized for, uh, for reading older data to do analytics. So you can always find the, the oldest version here, right? Um, for SQL Server, when you buy their timetable, uh, time travel extension, they end up giving you this, this architecture here. The, master, the, the, the main table always stores the master version, and they copy old versions over to the other side. All right, the last approach is to use delta storage. And this is like time travel tables where you have the main table, and then you have a separate storage space where you put different versions. But the difference is that instead of storing the actual entire tuple that, that, that got from the older version, we end up only storing just the changes that were made from the, uh, from the old version. So what will happen is, on update here, we're going to copy the values that were modified from the old version and put them into the, the delta storage. So in this case here, if I have a transaction that updates this, this tuple here and that only updates this one field, that, the value field, we'll just store that the old, what the old value was in the, in the delta storage. And then we have our pointer to say, if you need to go back in time and find this, here's where, to go, here's where, here's where it is, right? Do it again, same thing. I modify that, I create a new, new delta record, and then I can update the master record. So what's, what's one obvious benefit of this? Less storage, right? So you can always go back in time and recreate the older version by essentially just replaying this, this, you know, these, these delta records to get you back into the correct state. All right? This is what Hyper does. This is what uh, MySQL does. This is what Oracle does. And I'll, I'll show this at the end. This is actually what Postgres, as of yesterday, found out, uh, is, con is considering this as well. Um, this also makes it really easy to do garbage collection because, as we'll see in a second, you don't have to go scan through the, the main table heap to find older versions that aren't visible anymore. You just go to one location, figure out what the high water market is for, tra for transaction IDs, and just blow away the whole the, the rollback segment. And that's enough. Yes? So in this, we need to go for each tuple. We need to go through multiple version change for every attribute. Right? So this question is, for each tuple, we need to go through multiple version chains for, for each attribute because, like, uh, if you have like oh, yeah. So his question is, um, if I uh, if I modified a um, if there's another column here, and I modified it from a transaction long ago, right? And I need to go back in time to, to find it. I may have to go back mo through multiple version chains, or what are you saying? Go, uh, so for each column, I need to go through its version chain to find the work. No, no, so, so the, the, the version chain here is not per column or per attribute. It's for the entire tuple. Okay. So I'm only showing, this, this tuple only has two attributes. I'm only showing value here. But if I had a third attribute and it was modified, then I, I would, that'd be in there as well. OK. okay. So one additional thing uh, that we can, we can talk about is how to deal with non-inline attributes. So this is independent of, the, uh, of what version storage, version storage scheme you can use. Um, the issue is that, as I said, in the in-memory database, unlike a disk-based database, we store all the fixed length attributes together contiguously in the fixed length arena pool. And then all the variable length data, like large var chars, uh, var binaries, text fields, they'll be stored in a separate data pool. And then in our fixed length uh, tuple, we will just have a 64-bit pointer to some location in the, uh, the variable length pool to go find that data. So if I create a new version, right, and I say my transaction updates this, only this one fixed length field, uh, I have to go create a, make another copy of my uh, of my string field or varchar field here and make sure that this thing uh, points to that, right? So an obvious way to optimize this is that if the varchar field or the string field doesn't get modified from one version to the next, there's no reason to go make another copy of this, right? So instead, we can reuse the pointers uh, to the variable length field for versions of attributes that don't change from one version to the next, right? So for do this, though, I have to put a reference counter as a prefix on the, on the field to keep track of how many tuples or how many different versions are actually pointing to that field, right? Um, 
The downside of this is that uh, you, it makes it difficult to relocate memory. Um, so say I'm doing compaction, I want to reorganize my, my varlang pool. Since I don't know who's actually pointing to me, uh, I have to do a sequential scan if I want to change this memory address to somewhere else. Or I have to add an indirection layer, which is another overhead, uh, to deal with the fact that multiple guys could be point pointing to me, and I want to change the actual physical address. This is not so much a problem if your database system can do compression, because if you have strings that are repeatable, then you can do dictionary encoding and distort the dictionary code here, right? But if you have just if, you, if it's a not if it's a unique varchar that gets copied from one version to the next that you're not going to want to put in a dictionary encoding, then you can use this approach to to handle this. So this is something we tried in our own system. Uh, we end up abandoning it because the we end up storing a varchar field, a varchar, a varchar, a varchar or variable length pool per tile group or per block of tuples. So you couldn't have we didn't want to have different tuples and different blocks point to uh, var chair, uh, varlin pools that aren't in the same block. So we tried this and we ended up abandoning this in our own system. But this is something I, I like to look at later. All right, the last one is garbage collection. All right, so again, if you're coming from, if you understand how garbage collection works in programming languages, like a, manage, a memory managed platform like Java, uh, it's essentially the same idea. Right? We're creating all these new versions of, uh, of the tuples. And then eventually, these tuples are no longer these versions are, are no longer be visible to any transaction. So we want to go back and, and reclaim that memory, right? So the definition of when we're going to say that we are allowed to reclaim a physical version is when we know that there's no other transaction could possibly see that 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 version, and this is defined under snapshot isolation because we we know what the timestamp it is for all the transactions that started, so we know what's visible to them or not. And then obviously, if any if any version gets created by an aborted transaction, we know that no one should ever be able to see it, and we want to go ahead and reclaim their memory. So there's two additional design decisions we have to deal with when we want to do garbage collection. Um, the first is how we actually look for expired versions, and then how we actually can decide when it's safe to reclaim memory. So in the sake of time for this class, I'm only going to discuss the first one. The second one we'll cover next week when we talk about uh, indexes more. Um, and, you're, and I'm going to have to implement this in your, in your index for project number two, because uh, you have to implement it sort of the same epoch-based garbage collector that, that Silo uses. So we'll cover this more later. I'm going to focus on this one for now. So there's two approaches. Uh, the first approach is to do what's called, the way to think about their approaches is in the scope of how they're going to find these, these, these old versions that they can reclaim. So the first way is to do it at a tuple level scope. And this is where the database system is going to have to examine tuples individually and decide whether that version should be reclaimed or not. And two ways we can do this is through background vacuuming or, or cooperative cleaning. And then the other approach is do transaction level scope, where all the transactions are going to maintain their read write sets, all right, essentially pointers to the tuples that they, that, or the pointers to the versions that they read or modified. And then when they commit, they hand off that read set, write set to a uh, separate thread or garbage collector. And then it goes and figures out whether those versions are actually visible and then go, go, goes ahead and prunes them. Right? So the thing we'll see in, in, in Hecaton next week is that you know, these two different approaches, this is probably what people, most people use. And in general, garbage collection amounts for about 15% overhead of the actual runtime performance of the system, right? and it, which is unavoidable because you know, we, we, we have to clean up these old versions because otherwise we run out of space. So let's look real high level examples of the two of these. So with back on vacuuming, what we're going to have is we're going to have a separate thread that's going to periodically scan through the, through the database, database system or the database to the tables. And it's going to look to see whether tuples are visible. Uh, this is probably the most common approach. Uh, and it also works with any, any possible version storage scheme that we talked about. So this is supposed to represent a vacuum thread. But generally, it, it records what are the actual transactions that are running. And then it just scans through every single tuple, looks at the begin and end timestamp, and recognizes whether any, for all the actual transactions that it has, if there's any version that is not, that does not overlap with those active transaction IDs, right? So in this case here, the transaction ID is 12, transaction ID is 25. The, the range 1 to 9 is not visible to them. So we know there's no other active transactions, so it's safe for us to go ahead and, and delete these versions. 
right? In the case of this one here, B2, since 12, it comes between 10 and 20, it knows not to delete this version, right? So this is what Postgres does. Uh, this is what this is probably what the most common approach that people use when they use uh, multi uh, when they want to do uh, garbage collection. One simple uh, optimization you can do that Postgres does is you can keep track of a dirty bit per block, and when you pass through the garbage collector, you check to see whether that that dirty bit is set to true, meaning it was modified since the last time the vacuum went through. And if it's not set, then you know you can skip it entirely. If it is set, then you go go inside and figure out uh, what you need to reclaim. Uh, the other approach is cooperative group cleaning, and basically what happens here is the threads, as they scan that scan the version chains, since they're already checking to see whether the version is visible to them or not, you might as well check to see whether it's actually uh, should be deleted the, the, or the memory should be reclaimed. And then the thread, as it does the scan or as it traverses the version chain, will actually clean up the old versions for you. Right? So in this case here, version ID 12 comes along, and then it'll check to say, you know, is version A4 visible to me? If not, then it sets a little uh, bit to say, or flag to say that it's going to be cleaning it. So it's allowed to have to get and prune it. And then it prunes it on the fly and then keeps going along and, and until it actually finds the tuple that I was looking for. All right, so you're sort of piggybacking off of the, uh, you know, the normal scan operations you have to do on the version chains to do, to do the garbage collection. There's one additional optimization that you have to deal with if you want to do cooperative cleaning. Uh, and that is because uh, you only clean things when people scan through it. If you have a version chain that has not been scanned through in a while, then essentially it's, it's never going to get reclaimed. So in the Hackathon paper, they call these dusty corners. So you periodically have to invoke a thread that basically does the background vacuuming, just to check to see whether you have anything that needs to be reclaimed. And this only obviously only works with oldest to newest, because if this was newest to oldest, then you would never go to the end if you're only looking at the newest versions. So by, by being oldest to newest, you force every thread to always have to go down the version chain, and then you find the things that delete. Yes? Uh, for co corrective uh, cleaning, when you traverse through the old, old triples, do you like decrement a counter in it? Or it's like the uh, garbage collection, the thread doing garbage collection actually know all the active transaction ID? So your, your question is, uh, as the thread is doing scanning through the version chain, how does it know what is, should be deleted or not? Yeah. Right? You, ha you have to know what are the other active transactions that are out there. right? All right, so the last way to do garbage collection is uh, through transaction level garbage collection. As I said, in this approach, you just have every transaction as it runs, collects its read write set, and then uh, when the transaction c commits, you hand that off to the garbage collector, uh, and then it just it knows whether those 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 tuples are visible or not, and then it can go ahead and delete them. Right. So for this. You still need to maintain multiple threads to actually do garbage collection because you may be creating new versions so fast that you're going to run out of memory. So you have to add new new tuple or new threads to do garbage collection so you start reclaiming space, right? So there's this classic trade-off between how many garbage collection threads you want versus how many uh, transaction threads you want, right? If you have too many transaction threads, you may not reclaim memory fast enough, uh, and you start thrashing. If you have too many garbage collection threads, then they're obviously not processing transactions, and so that slows down your, your throughput there. So how to figure out how to do the, the right balance of these is, is, is non-trivial. All right, so real quickly, I want to talk about how to deal with wraparound. So the, all these timestamps are going to be you know, some integers, unsigned integers that always need to be increasing. And at some point, even if, we're, if we have 64-bit 64 64 integers, we're going to hit the limit of, of the, that ID or the integer, and we're going to wrap around back to zero. And this is problematic if we're using these transaction IDs to figure out what's visible to us because what will happen is we'll have a transaction that we'll have a bunch of versions that were created by transactions with really high timestamps and then we'll wrap around back to zero or one and now all of these uh, all of these versions that should really be in the past will now look in the future because their transaction ID is greater than, than my transaction ID. So in this case here, if I wrap around and have a new transaction with, with transaction ID 1, this tuple here is no longer visible because it's created with a really, really high uh, timestamp. Right? So we need a way to, to deal with this 
because there's a bunch of weird stuff can start to happen, right? If you if you wrap around and not handle it correctly, so you can have things like deleted rows that you, you know, rows that you thought were deleted start reappearing, updated versions go back to their old state, right? Because all that same things we just talked about before when you're traversing the version chain, that depends on the the, the transaction IDs or timestamps always going increasing in time. But now I'm back, you know, back to one. So. The, uh, I'll skip through this, but the, the one example, I, I think the easiest way to handle this is, is actually what Postgres does. Um, and it's actually, I mean, it's almost kind of trivial in, in, its, in, its, in its simplicity. So basically what they do is that as you get closer to the upper limit of your, your transaction ID, then uh, they will stop processing transactions. They, you can avoid this having to stop entirely because you can do you know, vacuuming ahead of time and sort of clean things up. But at some point, you have to stop processing transactions because otherwise you could hit all those that, that wraparound problem. And so what they're going to do is the vacuum is going to go through and it's going to set a, a, a flag in every tuple that is part of this older version before the wraparound to say that it's now frozen in time. Right? It's a simple, simple bit flag. And then now what happens is that any transaction ID uh, that gets generated will always be considered to be newer or in the future from any tuple that has this frozen bit set. So my fro I, have I save a tuple at version 10, I flip the, the frozen bit, so now my transaction ID is one, I check that frozen bit, it's set to true. So no matter what the actual timestamp or transaction ID for that frozen tuple is, I know that it always has to be in the past. So basically they have to do a full scan, set all these frozen bits before they wrap around, and that ensures that everything's back in the past. Right? So they avoid having to do a complete stop. Right? If you get to the point where you can't generate any, any new transaction IDs, Postgres will stop, drop you down to a single user mode, don't accept any new updates, and the only thing you can do is run the full vacuum. And so they try to be a bit aggressive and try to avoid this ahead of time by running the vacuum and cleaning things up before it gets, gets, gets too bad. All right, uh, the next thing discussed is index management. Um, I'm running out of time again. That's not good. Okay, I love it so much, right? Uh, all right, so for this, if we, if, since we said before, the indexes always have to, per, at least the, for a primary key, there's always going per, to point to the version chain head, right? And how often we're going to have to update this primary key index really depends on how often we're creating a new version or a new head of the version chain, right? Doing updates is, is simple. You just update the existing key and you set it to be, now, you set the value in the index to point to the new, new head of the version chain. To deal with uh, updates of the actual primary key value itself, like if I, if I change if my primary key is my email address and I then change that my email address, then I need to get, ha be careful about having two keys in my index point to now to the same version chain. Right? There's actual, actual logic you have to do to, to handle that. So to avoid that, as far as I know, most systems just treat an update to the primary key attribute for a tuple as a delete followed by an insert. So I delete the old tuple, and then I insert a new one. So technically, at, a, at the highest level, you can think of it semantically as being the same logical tuple, but underneath the covers, it's actually treated as two separate version chains. Right? Now, the tricky one is secondary indexes. Um, and this is a, a great example of why this actually mat mat matters a lot in MVCC, uh, is this blog article that Uber put out uh, in, in April 2016, it was right around the time we were writing this paper, and I felt so vindicated. I'm like, oh yes, this is this is totally a hard problem that no one's thinking about, right? And so Uber in this blog article, they talk about how that uh, they had to go from Postgres to MySQL because of the way. Part of the reason was the way that MySQL and Postgres handled their secondary indexes in a multi-version environment. The true story actually is that they went from they started off with MySQL, then they hired some guy that really loved Postgres, so then they switched to Postgres. And then they realized that for their workload, the secondary index management was a problem, so then they had to switch back to MySQL, right? So I'm sure that cost them millions of dollars. If they had they read my paper beforehand, they could have saved them that money and sent it to us, but <laughs> that's fine. All right, so, so for secondary indexes, the tricky part is now, what are we actually gonna point to, right? And there's two ways to do this. We can have a logical pointer that points to some, uh, it has a sort of fixed identifier, that doesn't change no matter how many times we have different versions of that tuple. And to do this, we can have uh, you can use a primary key, or we can use some kind of an in, in, in internal a tuple ID, like a record ID, for example. 
But this requires to have an indirection layer to go from this logical identifier to the actual physical pointer, the physical address of the head of the version chain. The other approach is use physical pointers, where it's just going to use, always just point to the, the physical uh, pointer chain. So let's look at this visually. So say that we have a, a, a single version chain here, and for this we're doing append only newest to, newest to oldest. So every single time I create a new version here, I have to append a new record uh, and put it at the front of the version chain and then update these pointers. So for the primary key index, this is always going to have a pointer to the physical address of the head of the version chain. So every time I, I create a new version, I have to go update the primary key. Right? It's unavoidable. It's, it's, that's not, not a big deal. But for secondary indexes, uh, if I point to my uh, physical address, then the same thing. Every single time I add a new version, I have to go update that, that index. Now, if it's one index, that's not a big deal. But the problem is that if you have a lot of these secondary indexes, that means for every single time I update this, regardless if I even update the, the value that these indexes are keyed on, then I have to go and update all of the pointers. Right? And this is what Postgres does. And this is the problem that uh, Uber was having is because in their workload, they were doing a lot of updates and they had a lot of secondary indexes on these tables. And every single update required them to, up, to modify the physical address that's being stored in all these, these, these indexes. So a way to get around this is use a, 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 a logical identifier. So one, you can just have to store the primary key. And then when you want to figure out the physical address, you do a lookup in the secondary index. You get back the primary key. Then you do a second lookup in the primary key index, and then that gives you the physical address. Right? So now, if I up, no matter how many times I update the, uh, the number of versions for that tuple, the primary key doesn't change. If the primary key does change, then that's a delete followed by an insert, and it's treated, it's treated separately. The other alternative is to use a logical identifier, like a tuple ID, and this requires us to have an indirection layer uh, to do a mapping from that tuple ID to an address. In our system, this is actually what, what we use. In Postgres, they use the, the primary key pointer. Um, in no one way is better than another. Uh, I think for this, um, if your primary key is only a 64-bit integer or 30-bit integer, then that's small, that's fine. Uh, if it's something really large, then you would have to store that in the secondary index, which I think is wasteful. OK, so we're short on time, so I'm going to show one graph. right? And this is sort of the money shot of the takeaway graph from the paper. And for this, we're going to run the TPCC benchmark on a machine with four sockets and 10, ten cores per socket. Uh, and we're going to scale up along the x-axis the number of threads we're allocating uh, in the system to execute transactions. So the main takeaway I want you to get from this is that although we're all running inside the same system, you actually see there's quite a gap here in, in terms of performance. Right? At the very top, you have NuoDB, Hyper, and MySQL, and Oracle. And for these systems, you know, there's not one thing I can point to and say, this is what you need to do if you're building an MVC system that gets you the best performance. Right? Oracle and MySQL are using rollback segments of the Delta storage. NuoDB is doing, uh, is doing the append only. Um, some of them, I think, are using the logical pointers for indexes. Others are using garbage collection in different ways. Uh, so again, there's, it depends on the workload, depends on what the application wants, depends on you know, what's in your database in terms of the size of the database, how many indexes you have. The, it will vary a lot. So that was sort of one the main takeaways you got from that paper was it depends, right? So what we see, though, one thing interesting is that the bottom here is Postgres, right? Uh, and I, the, main, the things I think Postgres, uh, we're on video, be careful. Uh, <laughs> the append only storage, I think, is, is, is probably, and, and then the, 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 the physical pointers are probably the two, the combination of those two things, I think, cause the most problems. And as I said, there's a, the this blog article came out yesterday, January 30th, uh, this is written by one of the lead developers, uh, Robert Haas, on, that works on Postgres at, at Enterprise DB. And he basically talks about switching from the uh, append only storage model to the Delta storage model, the same thing that's used in MySQL and, and, and Oracle. Right? So, this is an active thing that people are actually considering now um, to try to fix it in Postgres, to try to boost these numbers. 
and we'll see we'll see how that goes. And I think actually this is probably what we should do in our own system. Um, but right now we're using a pen-only storage. Again, it's this trade-off. If you if you're trying to do a lot of reads, then a pen-only storage can be good, uh, depending how you organize things. So, right. So it's, so in some ways it's sort of disappointing, right? You get through this great 12-page paper and it talks about all the nitty-gritty details of all these different things you have to consider in an MVCC database, and then it's like, yeah, it depends, right? So that was disappointing. All right, so uh, the main takeaways. The um, MVCC is probably the best approach for doing uh, transactions in a mixed workload environment. So we'll talk a little bit more about this during the semester as we get to talk about analytical queries. But for concurrent control, we're mostly focusing on OTP operations, but we also want to be executing analytical queries at the same time. It's called a hybrid environment or mixed workload environment. And the MVCC, because it has this nice benefit that the readers are not blocked by writers, uh, is actually ideal for, for that scenario. I think that's part of the reason why people, people choose to use it. Um, there's a bunch of under interesting research topics that I want to explore uh, in the context of our system that I, I don't think have been uh, addressed. Uh, one is how to do block compaction. This is maybe only an issue for a pen only storage, uh, but I think also in if it, we're very like pools and, and compression and other things, I think this, is, this could be interesting. And then we're also looking at see how we can exploit the semantics of snapshot isolation to do online schema changes. So the way to think about this is if I, if I add a new column, like call alter table and add a column, uh, in most systems now, what they'll actually do is, is go apply that update immediately. So they'll scan through every single tuple, make a copy of it, add the new column, and insert that uh, as, as, as the new master version. So I think you don't have to do that. I think we can do this lazily by exploring the fact that we can have different versions of tuples that are controlled by different versions of a schema. And so you can call alter table, add a column, and it immediately comes back and says, I did it. But underneath the covers, you can manage when that column actually gets propagated to, your, to, the, to the table. So this is something I think is actually a paper we're working on now. And if you're interested in getting involved in this, send me an email. All right, we're well over time. Uh, so I'm going to stop now. I'll, I'll discuss project two in more detail in, uh, on Monday. I'll be sure to a lot time for this. But the website will be up. You generally, you're gonna have to implement a skip list. Skip list is a latch-free uh, concurrent index. Um, and you need to be able to support garbage collection and forward reverse iteration. So skip list is the primary index used in MemSQL. They are huge on skip lists. Right? They claim it's amazing because it's latch-free. It's not that great. Uh, <laughs> so, you will be implementing something that our other indexes can beat. So BWT will be, able to be will be able to beat a skip list, and the art index and the B plus tree can crush crush these things. The reason why I have you guys implement skip list is because it's actually really easy to implement. Uh, I shouldn't say that. It's well relative to the other ones, it's much easier. So we the first year I taught this class, we had to implement, implement the BW tree. That was a huge mistake. Uh, that was way more complicated. Now I completely underestimated it. So so now we're doing skip list because it covers all the important things that we want to talk about, like compare and swap, garbage collection, um, and how it fits into the rest of the database system, but it's actually something you can implement in a month. So I'll cover this more on Monday. I'll bump the deadline for this to be an extra few days because we won't announce it until later. Um, but if you haven't signed up yet for, the, uh, for your group on the spreadsheet, please do that. Or contact me if you don't have a group and we'll find somebody for you, okay? All right, guys. Uh, have a good weekend. See ya. Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson. One court and my thoughts hip-hop related. Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, playing waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze as a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you, let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Records still turn with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off, with St. Ives